I was desperate, you know, at the time I was 17, 18, unemployed, you know, and I was desperate to, you know, to get a break. And I knew that if I did get a try, I would, you know, I would grab the chance. I think it was always going to be boxing. I mean, I stepped into the gym as a 10 or 11 year old. Boxing just took hold of my heart straight away. I love everything about the sport of boxing. Hello, I'm Marie Crow, and this is We Become Heroes, the Orshi sport podcast that explores how these athletes and sports people reach the top of their game and the lessons that they learned along the way. I'm delighted to say that my guest today is Waterford hurling legend Paul Flynn. Paul, first of all, how are you? How's life? Good, Marie. Thanks. Uh, not too bad at all. Yeah. Um, happy after yesterday, I suppose. Uh, Waterford, I suppose they won ugly, if that's if that's the term we can use, but uh, at least they have an early win in the bag and uh, I think those two points will be very valuable mm. for the rest of the championship but yeah all good yeah it really will so like we're the day after Easter how are you feeling about championship and underway uh, I wouldn't I, I don't like it to be honest Marie. Um it was kind of a weird feeling Easter Sunday cold wet miserable no, it can be that way too in May and June I know but um, it, it's it, it's going to be a hard one I think even at the all Ireland in July you know, the rest of the summer, August, September. Um, sure, we see how it pans out, but uh, if Waterford win it, it'll be the best championship ever. Um, that's it really, isn't it? It's if they're out early or if any county are out early, then you'll really lament a long summer ahead. But if you're there in the latter stages and you've plenty of time to celebrate and then into a club championship, it won't be so bad. So, like, let's have a quick chat about Waterford. What's impressing you about this team? Uh, well, the current, I suppose, it's Liam Cahill's, you know, uh, third year there, I think, isn't it? And I suppose he's kind of getting the players to to play the way he wants. I suppose it, it takes a while. Um, he's discovered a couple of new players. They, they seem to have more options than ever before, that if someone comes in, the team isn't isn't being weakened. Uh, the lads who come on know their job and uh, they bring, I suppose, an extra bit of pace and power to the play later on in the game. But I think yesterday, like, I mean, that yesterday typified, I suppose, in years gone by, that was a game that Waterford may not have won. Um, started very sluggishly, but um, I suppose found their way into the game. And then I suppose when Austin Gleeson and Jamie Barron came on at halftime, they really upped the energy part of it and, and um, the score won six without reply. And to turn around the four-point deficit within three minutes of the restart, I think that's obviously where Waterford got their hands on the win, but I think Tipperary will be disappointed. And they had some poor wides towards the end of the game that, you know, Tip are in transition, you know, I think, are they really, you know, this is the tip that's going forward. So I think the fact that I know they've lost, obviously, the, the Warriors, Brenda Maher and uh, the Project Maher, but it's, um, you know, Tip are, tip are never a bad team. So, you know, if someone takes their foot off the gas and they think that Tip is in transition, I think they'll get a, a nice fright. So afterwards, um, Liam Gall spoke about the weight of expectation that is now on Waterford and made the point that look they haven't won anything yet which is um, which is a key point really and uh, you know the way people are talking about them it's where they'd already won the Liam McCarthy but you know he, he mentioned that it's really hard to protect the lads from that like how difficult is it going to be to manage the pressure that comes with that expectation now as the season goes on Yeah uh, like yeah, Saturday you know I was going to a match and was listening to the, the, the RT uh, sports show and, and like they were all picking Waterford as the story of the summer and you know I was saying to myself bloody hell like Limerick haven't okay they had a disappointing league but I think that was nearly intentional I think Limerick have come out even stronger uh, more powerful even more <laughs> even more bigger so looking at them yesterday so I think yeah Waterford win the league people will have their eyes on them but I think as the Munster Championship progresses uh, it will become very evident that Limerick are still the team to beat and the focus will switch away from Waterford a bit onto Limerick. Uh, I know they play next weekend, so pending what happens there. But um, like people seem to forget, like Limerick beat Waterford last year by eleven points in the semi final, and uh, while Waterford have strengthened their panel, there's no question about that. Like, but the, the Limerick fifteen are just um, they show up every day. You know, they just haven't. They've had one bad day in about four years. The year they lost to Kilkenny in the semi final, and. Um, you know, they, they are the benchmark. So while everyone would like to see Waterford win the All Ireland, I'm sure, and um, there's no one in Limerick that are just going to leave that happen. Yeah, and I think watching them yesterday, it was fairly clear that during the league they were probably training really, really hard and were getting ready 
to attack the championship and you could see it all coming together yesterday, all the hard work that they had done when they were looking Absolutely. a little bit lethargic or a little bit maybe off the pace yeah. because I'd say they were they were working hard in the in the during the week when we weren't seeing them. And there's a team also uh, in, in in Leinster called Kilkenny that are love, <laughs> love all this chat of Munster. It. it goes on every year, like the Munster <laughs> Championship and Munster, Munster, Munster. And meanwhile, you know, you'll you'll find Kilkenny in an Ireland semi final nice and quietly. And you know, they they've had a decent league. He's they've unearthed a few players. Um, TJ will be back, and so like I mean, all this talk of Munster hurling kind of suits Kilkenny as well. Of course, it does. Um, well, I'm, I'm going to put you on the spot then. So when the All Ireland final does come in August, or is it July? Can you remember that at this stage? July, um, I think. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> who will be walking the steps of the Hogan? Oh, hopefully Connor Prunty, obviously from a water point of view. But you know, being 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 realistic, um, some are, some are going to have to beat Limerick, um, and even you know beating Limerick in the semi final, then you know you're not doing yourself any favours but I would think Limerick are, are clear favours to, to carry out and go to three in a row um, you know Galway Galway Waterford um, you know I think Clare are gone very quiet and, you know they're, they're waiting to, to, inter, to start their, their campaign at the weekend Tony Kelly being back so look I, mean, I, it, it, I think if Limerick weren't as strong as they were it could be anybody but I, I honestly think Limerick are the, are the team to beat yeah, I think I agree with you as well. Okay, let's get into your career career then. So um what was your earliest, what is your earliest memory of sport? Oh I, I suppose like my dad played for Wadford in the 70s. Um and I suppose he, he played on goal, so his his career was I suppose prolonged in, in Club Hurling back back in the day. And I suppose my earliest memories has been um being at club training in Bally Gunner when back in the day, like when Bally Gunner had no pitch. You know, they used to train in St. Pat's Park, which was a soccer pitch, belonged to De La Salle College, and then they'd get a field off a farmer. And next season, they'd be in a different field. And so um, the castle field then became a home. Uh, it's only over the road. So it was kind of the first pitch that Bally Gunner had. Still only an end of the field, but it was kind of a, a pitch. And we had a bell container for our dressing rooms. So um, I suppose going, going training with my dad when I was three, four, five years of age and I suppose going around collecting slitters or nine people for stuff. And, <laughs> but, um, and then that matches, I suppose, trying to get in under the wire to get into the pitch. And So I suppose that, that you know, the Bally Gunner Intermediate at the time and um, they lost a couple of Intermediate Finals in the early 80s and eventually winning the Centenary Final 84. So they came up senior and have been senior since, obviously. So, um, yeah, that'd be my earliest memories, I suppose. And then I suppose watch a match today trying to stay up late to watch a match today as a three or four or five year old so um but hurling hurling would have been my first my first memory yeah. who were your heroes then when you were growing up like did you have posters oh. on the wall and if so who were they oh yeah um i suppose joe cooney from galloway was someone i i, I always watched and, and got to and got to admire um i suppose back then i suppose the monster final wasn't even on telly the only hurling matches on telly were the all Ireland semi-final uh, finals and then the final so you had three hurling matches on telly that was kind of it um, so Galway would play either Munster champions or Leinster champions every every second year so you were kind of looking at the same players the Cork players mainly Cork, Galway and Kilkenny so uh, John Fenton and Joe Cooney would have been the two hurlers that I would have um, just liked watching I, I, and kind of I suppose when you're in the garden then after a match or trying to Malays, whoever and they were the two so that was kind of that's kind of where the draw kind of I suppose for taking line balls or freeze or stuff like that trying to emulate uh, I suppose how John Fenton did it. Did you? Was there other sports? Did you play other sports? I did. I, I did uh, not. Not till not till I got about ten. Bally Gunner was out in the country at that stage, and like school holidays was just hitting the ball against the wall or, or that type of thing. So when you got kind of opened up into secondary school in De La Salle College. I started playing Gaelic football and soccer, a bit of soccer. So um, Bowes would be the local club, well, one of the clubs in Waterford City and uh, started playing with those under 12, I think it was, and um, got lucky enough then to play a bit of Kendy Cup, which was kind of like under 14 interleague uh, competitions. And we got to the All-Ireland final and played Cork before the 1989 Cup final in Dalymount. Dave Barry, 
was playing for Cork City, Pat Morley. And um, yeah, just that was a whole new experience. Like I'd played in Welsh Park and Hurland and stuff like that, but to play in a, a proper soccer ground, like with the crowds, first time playing in front of a crowd playing soccer, but uh, that was enjoyable. So yes, I turned a lot to soccer then between the ages of 13 to 17 and uh, played a nice bit of it, but then kind of realised that it was going nowhere. So stuck to the hurling then. <laughs> like, how did you realise it was going nowhere? Because clearly you were you were decent if you were playing Kennedy Cup level. Like, that's one yeah. of the best in county. Yeah, well, I, I ended up playing school by under 15 and 16 as well. And maybe, I suppose I was across channel a bit with Aston Villa. And when it didn't work out there, um, you know, you kind of realised that... Uh, you know, came back home, played one season League of Ireland, but didn't didn't push it on. And Hurling was always there, and um, being a Hurling house, and you know, soccer soccer was enjoyable. I loved playing it. I must say, it was it was very very enjoyable. But um, I was kind of splitting my time between both. And in the end, sure, you know yourself when 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 matches collide, even when they do with kids nowadays, like I mean, they do cho- choose which one they, they favour. Mm-hmm. And um, I suppose the Water and Minor Hurling team came that year then as well so um just went just went with the hurling yeah it was so casual about it you're just uh, like, oh, I had a bit of time over in Aston Villa played a bit of League of Ireland like that's a good achievement in itself yeah but I, I was a goalkeeper you see but I was too small so uh, um like I mean at the time in England a couple of matches I did play like I remember training with Nigel Spink and whoever else Les Healy was there and like these guys were six foot four six foot three and big men and like here's me or whatever five nine five ten on my toes, it just wasn't gonna, just wasn't gonna wash. And uh, you know, it's kind of, it's kind of something I did then. Once I realised that if I wasn't going to get better and better and better and better and better at it, I just pulled the plug on it. And um, that's kind of you know I've no regrets over because it, yeah. it was out of my it was out of my hands to be honest with you. You know you you wouldn't have been picked and you wouldn't have you wouldn't have got any further and you'd end up being heartbroken over in Birmingham. <laughs> Is that was it purely because a height thing? Uh, yeah. I, well, I, I at the start, yes. Like, I mean, if I was definitely, if I was like say six foot three, I would have got a better shot at. Mm-hmm. Um, it would have, you know, it, you might have prolonged yourself as well. You could have been cutting yourself more. But uh, oh, it is definitely like I mean, when you see, like, I can't name any goalkeeper for you that's under six foot. Like Shay Given was six foot, six foot one. He would probably be the only one. The rest of them are, 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 are like basketball players. Yeah, you know. big men. Yeah. So when you decided then to to focus on hurling, like I assume that when you were playing soccer, you'd been tipping away anyway. Like you were you were straight into it then full tilt. Yeah, uh, played Dean Ryan Hearty Cup uh, with De La Salle College. We we had a six we had a five year cycle. So we'd no transition year. And so we were kind of young, we were a young Hearty Cup team. So we were kind of like 16 and a half, 17. Whereas the schools like Flannan's, uh, Coleman's, yeah, they had your six year cycle. So we were, while well, we had a good pick in Waterford City and South Kilkenny, um, we were just too young. And, you know, it's it's quite evident when a, a six, 16 and a half year old is marking like an 18 and a half year old. Um, we got to two semi finals, but. Uh, again, just pure strength. We were weren't big enough, so that that was kind of um, we we kind of that stopped us. And Flannans went on to win. I think Coleman definitely won one. Flannans won the other, and we never so we never got to play Kieran's or anything in, in a. We did win challenge match, but not not in anything serious. But yeah, so the the Heartland, like obviously played with the club under fourteen. Didn't make the Tony Forreston team under fourteen. Too small. Um, played played one year minor for Waterford and four years under 21 so it's amazing how things can change when you yeah. get to 6, 17 so yeah the small thing is coming up a little quite a bit that's <laughs> <laughs> a bit of a theme like yeah. uh, is it was that hard to deal with when you're young and you're trying to make it and you know it, like it's we're trying to make it in a couple of different sports well not make it but you know is yeah. it trying to reach your potential in different sports and you're you're being challenged by something that's out of your control I suppose the hardest thing about it is you can't get the ball. That's kind of the hardest thing. Um, I, only last week I was at an under 15 Gaelic football match, but our lads are all under 14 and they're playing in the under 15 B just to get experience in that. But when you see the difference, even a year makes, 
in size and power and strength. Like, I mean, when you're out in the field, you're probably naive to it and you're thinking, oh, I'll do my best. And, but you just, just can't. They're faster, they're bigger, they're more powerful. And even more so now because lads are even training harder, younger. So um, back then, I suppose, we, we just had the numbers in Ballygunner. We were, it was a small place. Um, so you would play nearly under 14, 15, 16, 17. You could play four years out of your age group where they've done that, done away with that now, rightly so, I suppose. But mm-hmm. um, no, I suppose at the time I didn't realise that it was small, but it was. <laughs> <laughs> now it was, yeah. So when did you realise you had talent then for sport? Um, I suppose when you started getting picked on candy cups and say Tony Farsell panels or you know or you're asked to go to a county trial or whatever that type of thing um you know um but you just go with it you just go with it you know I don't think you realize at some stage um Jesus I'm, I'm good or I'm bad or whatever but I suppose if if, if you are playing and you're, and you're being picked regularly and you happen to be the one that's a lead not a leader but you're 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 you're, you're you know you're in the game and you're prominent and you, you know maybe the manager wants you to do more because you you are you have a little bit extra than others that type of thing but I suppose you just go with it and I suppose when you're when you're with your friends and um, they wouldn't be long yeah bring you back to size if you, if you do think yes yeah, you're getting too big for your boots so when you were when you were growing up and and you know trying your hand at the hurl and, and the soccer what did you have to work on most like what were the things that you practiced most in your game um, good question. I suppose practice is the word. Like, I mean, I I kind of saw hurling as something that you could get better and better and better at um, with the ball and stick. And I think that's a lot of it is boring repetition. You know, um, I suppose a lot of drills training these these days are, are drill based and they're kind of um, not methodical or mechanical, but they're they're not game kind of situations whereas I think when you go training as a group you should be game situations but if you practice alone that's where you get your technique and, and your first touch and your left and right and catching the ball and that, that that's all achievable on your own in an alley or against the wall so I spent hours and hours at a pure boredom, boredom really Marie, at, at this side of town summer holidays evenings just tennis ball against the wall that was that was my practice tennis ball Tennis, well, that's all we had. Slitters were only for training. Okay. You know, if you lost this, if you lost a slitter in the ditch or something at home training, you know. Although dad used to train the, the juvenile teams as well, so there would be a bag of slitters there, but he'd have them counted and he'd know if there was one or two missing. All, all accounted for. God, different times. Yeah, yeah. unreal. <laughs> and what about the from the, the soccer point of view? Then, like, would you have spent? Was there things that you worked on regularly or, or areas of your game that you tried to improve? Yeah, well, I, Bose, the club, uh, had a very good Premier team. Um, so I would have been training with those even when I was 14, 15, 16. Uh, goalkeeping training, I suppose, was different than obviously the outfield stuff. Uh, for me, for me, I, I, I was never the loudest on goal, believe it or not. Like, I mean, I, I, communication is such a big part of soccer of all sports, but particularly soccer. And when you're on goal, you can see see what's happening in front of you and I suppose to advise, advise the players what's happening or the dangers. But I kind of struggled with that, with the talking part of it. Um, so how do you practice talking, I suppose? But we used to, we used to kind of um, do a lot of, again, just when you look back at it now, it was probably silly training compared to what, the methods they, they use nowadays and um you know you have the ladders and you have your the quick feet and but I was being being on your toes was a lot was a huge part of goalkeeping and um just being ready to spring off your feet if a shot did happen and we used to do a lot of that stuff but I suppose that kind of helped me in hurling in ways as well then to have a maybe you know a bit of speed off the mark type of thing. So you know you try anything really, really to get an extra inch or an extra advantage than anybody but Back in the day, I think it was training was just pure flog the horse rather than technical stuff. Yeah, I know. It's, uh, it's so different. It is. It is like yeah. running laps. And like, I haven't seen a team run a lap in, <laughs> in years. Like, you know? Yeah, yeah. Such sports science, I guess. Look, 
it's developed and moved on so so much um so was there a moment when you thought look maybe I can give this a go from a hurling perspective that I could actually go on and be a, a senior hurler at inter-county level? Uh, well, after playing minor for, for the county, I suppose you're hoping you're going to get picked under 21 and progress like that. Um, and as it happened, I got picked the year I was minor as well. The Waterford under 21 team was having a good run and they brought me in halfway through the season and I ended up playing the all Ireland final whenever it was late September. So I suppose when that happened, you know, we won the all Ireland under 21, you'd be thinking, oh, well, in two years' time, we'll have a go to senior next year or whatever. So, and that didn't work out that way. But I suppose my, from, my, from my own point of view, when that happened, I kind of said, yeah, well, look, if I keep myself some way right, I, I will get called into the senior panel. And I did um, in 1993. Yeah. So, I suppose from then on it was more or less try and improve your game. Like you're still, I'm still only 19 or whatever. So try to get stronger or, or look after yourself because hurling back then was more, a bit more physical. You know, you stayed in your position more. So you weren't moving us around as much. You were, you were more of a target. You could, you were sitting duck really, um, <laughs> you know. And uh, some of the cornerbacks back in the day were, they weren't exactly accommodating to let you, you know, have your own way. So it was kind of like, you have to learn how to play first, learn how to protect yourself and then learn how to start winning your own ball. And um, that took a while. And I, I remember we played Kilkenny in a challenge match in 93, the really good Kilkenny team. And I was marking Eddie O'Connor, who was a fantastic cornerback. And Bill Hennessy was wing back and Liam Simpson and Pat Dwyer, big, you know, serious experienced campaigners. And anything you got off them, you earned it. And only winning the ball was the easy part. It's trying to move move with the ball or even get a shot off was just so hard and that was an eye opener so um, but it's a good way to learn you know if things are easy you, you might you, you'd, um, you might take your eye off the ball a bit but you know playing against such players and um, just realising that you know see any level of adult sport is tough but to play against you know the top orders in Ireland would be something that's it's going to be really tough and it was Who was the toughest then? Oh, geez. Uh, oh, there was loads. You know, I can name Steve McDonough, Wayne Sherlock, Willie O'Connor, Eddie O'Connor, Brian Lone, Frank Lone, <laughs> Bernard Ryan. Who else do you want? Jeez, it's, tough. it's tough in... Um, Dawn Flood. There's so many of them, like so many of those. Yeah. Anyone in the full back line there, like they're warriors by nature, really. Like, yeah, so it's such a, I suppose, as you said, like you're not in your position as much anymore. Everyone moves around so much. So you don't really get those yeah. intense one on one battles that we used to get years yeah. ago, which were fascinating in themselves. So, um, which is a bit of a pity, actually, because those duels were always, <coughs> well, I mean, they're brilliant. Good to, to look at. Good to look <laughs> yeah. at. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's look, it, 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 that's the way it is. It may go back that way in time, but you know, if you drifted out past the forty-five, you'd be told go back in, and you might be coming out for a break. <laughs> but, um, yeah, no, they're all great players, you know, um, super players. Um, but that's it, you know. Her, like, I mean, hurling, hurling. Like watch, watching the match yesterday, the Limerick and Cork game, and you know, there's plenty of guys there that young lads are obviously looking up to and, and wish trying to emulate after the match. So no matter what kind of way it's played, um, Hurland does have this certain kind of romantic um, attraction to it. And I suppose the fact that it's uniquely Irish and it's tribal, it's parochial, that, you know, people will just keep, you know, keep going to it and supporting it. And, keep, you know, there won't be a shortage of young lads in Limerick or Waterford wanting to play for Waterford. So that's, that's the good thing about it. Yeah, absolutely. Would you like to be playing nowadays? How do you think you'd fare? Um, well, I was told yesterday by about 40 people that I wouldn't cut it. So um, <laughs> uh, I'm told that at least once a week. You wouldn't like to be doing the training or you wouldn't run or not. So, well, look, that's the way it is. I can't answer that question. Would I like to be playing? No, I wouldn't. I'm happy to be finished. Um, spent whatever, the best part of 30 years between club and county, Harland. So, um had we had like we had our time, you know, enjoyed every bit of it. Um, but no, I, I I'm happy enough. I don't think you know t- things move on and there's other things going on and um, 
I like watching it. I like watching. Uh, I don't like watching the shorts passing stuff. I have to be honest. Uh, I find that very hard to to get my head around. And um, but when you see when you see good players in at full flight, that's the that's the joy of it. Like Noel McGrath yesterday, just being clever. You know, things like that. Uh, the pass he gave in to Jason Ford. And I know it's a great save by Sean O'Brien, but things like that would would make you go to matches. You know, Joe Canning, I suppose, loved watching him for 10 years or more. Uh, Tony Kelly, now is coming back, watching him, Austin Gleeson, Stephen Bennett. You know, so uh, TJ Reid, probably the best of them all. Yeah. You know, I'd go anywhere to watch TJ Reid play. So, no, but uh, delighted to, you know, have played and I have enjo- had enjoyed it. But no, I, I don't have any growth. To, I don't miss that, no. So when you think back on your career, what's the biggest setback that you had to overcome? Um, oh geez. Uh, the biggest problem we faced, I suppose, as a team in Waterford was we had to bridge a gap. Waterford hadn't won the Munster Championship in the Munster Minor Championship in 45 years. We won the Munster Minor Championship. They never won an under 21. We won an under 21. And then the senior Waterford hadn't won a Munster Championship since 63, I think. And we won it in 2002. We haven't won an All-Ireland since 59. We still haven't won one. So there's, there was always a gap. Mm. And I think when we when we did win the Munster Championship in 02, it was kind of celebrated like it was the All-Ireland. And that cost us. It definitely cost us because we had a seven-week wait to see who we were playing in the semi-final. It ended up being Clare who would come through to qualifying and um, they beat us in the semi-final and all of a sudden you're going, what just happened there? So I think as a team, for me, that's anytime we won anything, it was kind of celebrated a bit more than it should have been. Like, I mean, if they won the Munster Championship in Cork, they would we just put aside and they'd be concentrating on their, their semi-final or final. So that, that for me would be the, the one thing that if, if we were going at it again, that um, how do you deal with it? The earlier success is better because I think if we had won in All Ireland in ninety eight or ninety nine around that time. I think we could have won a few. Yeah, you know. I I would think though this by now lessons are learned from everybody, like as in even societally and, and culturally, the country is a little bit different now, and I don't think that you'd even be allowed. And maybe that's because things like social media are there now as well. So it's not like you can yeah. go a week or anything like that. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I was thinking about that this morning, that um, if Twitter was around when we were playing, my God, <laughs> you know, you'd be paranoid walking around, I'd imagine. <laughs> yeah, you just can't do anything anymore. Like, you know, so I'd say you get your one night and then it's like, you know, yeah. you can't uh, go off somewhere for a few days or anything like that back in the back in the good old days. Um, Maybe the boat, the boat over this the boat over the Holly Head or something. <laughs> you'd be, you'd be, who did I see? Sean Dyche. That was it. I saw there's pictures of Sean Dyche going around on social media. So obviously he, now totally harmless, but you know, he lost the job in Burnley and then he went out yeah. and he got out in the beer for a couple of days. But you're everyone that sees him is going in for the selfie. <laughs> so yeah. every movement since Friday has now been um has now been posted on Twitter. So you you can't even get a minute to I'd say process what's happened. Uh when you think about your career as well, who do you think had the biggest impact on it? Uh oh my dad, without doubt. Um you know we t- we talk we wouldn't talk a lot not tactically or anything, but he, you know, he 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 was full of advice for particularly underage, I suppose, you know. Um and when you look back it was just pure common sense, you know, like if the cornerback gets it you know, he's only going to hit it 40 yards, make just t- make a dart for the sideline, it's going to land there, you know, things like that early on. And, you know, um, he was a good coach. So, but it was all common sense, you know, to what's, he kept me very, um, if I played poorly, he, he had a nice way of saying it, like, you know, but um, if I played well, he he wouldn't mention it either. So, you know, he'd, he'd always pick something maybe that you could improve on or, and um, and even up to my adult days, playing playing for Waterford or playing whatever, and even playing soccer, he became an expert in soccer as well. Was, <laughs> but um, yeah, no, he just had advice, and it was common sense. And it was you know leave your leave your hurling and do the talking, leave your soccer, or whatever. Don't get involved, and 
um, things like that. And then obviously there were days you, you couldn't ignore, you had to get involved or whatever, but it was, yeah, hip, that, that to be fair. And it was, you know, more the chats, the chats I used to have with him more so than anything else, but everyone has that type of f- figure. I'm sure you'd be a coach or a friend or a brother or a sister, but, um, you know, to have my father, I suppose I went to every match with him. Uh, he used to go to, even if Clare were playing tip, or Cork were playing tip in the, in the Munster Championship back in the 80s. There was four or five of them used to go and I used to be trying into the booth at the, at the Volkswagen Estate and off we, off we go. So I, I grew up going to Munster Championship matches, you know, got the bug early and, and um, you know, it was, unfortunately for us back then with the knockout system, it was only one game a year, like for Waterford, most years. But um, you'd still, you know, you'd still have that bit of pride when you see the, I suppose the old retro jerseys going around now with the, with the, with the three stripes. <laughs> and, but yeah, no, so from that point of view, I had, you know, obviously then, um, Jerry McCarthy came into Waterford. Jim Green was a very good coach at minor level. Um, Peter Power under 21. And when Jerry McCarthy came into Waterford in 96, I think, um, the physical side of training got, I suppose, heavier, better, and we got stronger and fitter. So I suppose you'd learn a lot from the way Gerald uh, spoke to teams, spoke to players and treated treated players. So I would have, have him up there very highly as well. But I suppose the main the main character was my father, yeah. Yeah, it sounds like a, a lovely way of life, isn't it? Just going off, going to matches. I was the same. And it just yeah. feels like it was so simple. It was just such a simple time. You know, this time of the year, you're going to be going off to matches on yeah. the way. And looking you, forward to it, yeah. Looking Absolutely. forward to it. And you get out of the car and then you wouldn't, well, I, there were seven of us and you wouldn't see your dad until, yeah. you make sure that you're back in the car with a minute or two to go just in case. Yeah. And that was about it. it was try to dodge the, try to dodge the egg and onion sandwiches <laughs> and, the, and the horrible tea out of the flask. Or yeah. Um, so what about performances? So is there one performance that stands out in your mind has been you played like the hurler you always wanted to be? Oh, um, I don't know. That's for other people, I think, Marie, to kind of decide. Um, I, 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 lo- I love being part of the Waterford team I played with. Um, I think the two Munster finals, um, three we won, but um, 02, the first one, everyone, everyone kind of put their shoulders to the wheel that day. Um, oh seven was good. Oh four, ah, uh, first like I, I, I suppose I like fond memories of certain matches and and not so fond of other matches. But from to say which performance, I mean that I'd, I'd leave other people judge that. But um, I said for me it was just like even watching some of them, my teammates getting scores. You know, as I said earlier, you'd be you'd be in the corner more and you'd see the ball flying over the bar like going Kelly and. Mm-hmm. Dan and Ken, you know, in particular, I suppose, and, and to see Dan going up in full flight or own Kelly taking on guys, it was just, I'd rather, you know, say that to, I'd, I'd rather, I, as a team, I suppose, we we played Clare one day, would you believe, in the Munster Championship, I don't know what year it was, 04, 05, and I'd say that was probably the best match we played. Um, I think Dan got a hat-trick, but everyone kind of, everyone played well and, you know, it kind of put us on the road because we're beating the league final the week before. So I think as a team, that was a very important performance. But individually, I don't know if other people can decide. What do you think is um, has been your greatest success then? Oh, um, playing for so long, I suppose, really. Played for what? Played for whatever, 16, 17 years. Um, was I stupid? Probably. But... Um, <laughs> Um that was yeah, you know, uh that was it. I suppose having having started as a an 18 year old and got to 34 and um was part of a very good Valley Gunner club team as well. Um during that time we won eight county championships. So we lost probably as many as we won, but still we got a nice, a nice haul out of it. And um, you know, we won a Munster Championship. So to be part of a good, good, good club team and a good county team, I suppose, was probably what I'd be happiest about. Yeah, well, you're an awful lot luckier than most people because to even be able True. to say yeah. that is, uh, it's pretty, pretty sweet. Yeah. So, um, in terms of legacy, I know people find it really hard as well to answer this question. That's why I ask it. Like, what do you think your legacy will be? Uh, oh, Jesus. Uh, I don't, like, again, 
as you know, it is a hard one. Um, legacy. Um, I suppose a lot of people say to me, you didn't train that hard, so that could be legacy. But <laughs> I, my answer to that is that I practiced. I didn't, I practiced hard and trained with the team. Um, I, like, I mean... <laughs> Why did you leg- get that tag, by the way? A couple of lads in the club were just... <laughs> Slagging you. They hated me say like I mean we had we had an easy out I suppose back then if you were training with the, your club team and you were on the county panel and there was a bit of um, running done at the end you could always say I oh, look we're training tomorrow night with the county and you mightn't do the running and I might have pulled that trick I suppose once or twice too often but uh, I think that's where that came from um, yeah so it, it's a hard one to answer like I mean but um, I hope. I hope the team that we played on uh, inspired a few of the current lads. I suppose that's kind of what what you like. I mean, if they if they were the young lad that I was going to the match with their parents and they saw they saw Waterford win a monster. I, I never saw Waterford win a monster championship. So I suppose I hope that we give a bit of hope to the the young lads that went to the the matches when we were playing that they saw Waterford being competitive and successful in terms of winning Munster and the league and whatever it was. Uh, um, so I hope we, we uh, in some fashion, uh, help them get better. Pretty good legacy as well. Uh, what's next for you then? I know you're doing a little bit of coaching. Is it something that you see as part of your future? Uh, I, I enjoy, yeah, I, I enjoy it. Um, I, 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 re- I do enjoy it. I, I, enjoy, I enjoy the crack with the, obviously with the players. Um, the last two years have been very hard on players as well with no dressing room scenario mm. where a lot of the spirit and camaraderie and slagging and whatever goes on, you know, the dressing room environment is an important one for a team. So, you know, lads coming on and bikes already tugged out and gone away and, you know, there's not much interaction. So the dressing room is coming back into play now, slowly but surely, and I think teams will be the better of it. So uh, for me, yeah, um, hopefully... Uh, get more involved in the underage structure in Valley Gunner in the next year or two and um, see where that goes yeah so it's, it is good fun I, I do like to coach them to be fair and um, the matches are the hardest part because you know, <laughs> you're, you're, you're even anxious a couple of days before the match but um, yeah so I can imagine what it's like you know at, at the highest level like, I mean coaching and managing like I mean that it would it would assume your life and take over your take over your your spare time, but um, you know if if you have a grow for it and, and you and you feel that you have something to to add to it, it's worthwhile. So um, yeah, so I'd be hoping maybe to to go a little bit heavier into that side of it. Very good. Well, thank you so much for joining me. It's been an absolute pleasure, and I always think back to seeing the been been around for the era of hurling that you played in, and feel I was so privileged to witness. Yeah. So much of it because I think it was the best days of hurling that we've ever seen and um, that I will ever see anyway. So, Paul, thanks a million and thanks um, everyone as well for watching. Uh, Please like, subscribe and leave a review.